Hello and welcome. I am Kenneth Lapotten, Curator of Antiquities at the Getty Villa Museum in Los Angeles, home of the Getty's collection of ancient Greek, Roman, and Etruscan antiquities. Today's program is part of our Bacchus on Cork series, where we explore art, wine, and culture in antiquity. We invite experts in archaeology, classical history, literature, and science to share their research about wine cultivation and drinking practices in the ancient world, Greece, Rome, and beyond. On site, our programs typically include thematically paired wine tastings and an outdoor reception. Unfortunately, we can't do that today, but I encourage you to pour yourself a glass of wine as I have here because it's past five o'clock somewhere and have your own wine tasting experience at home. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at the wine shops of Pompeii with a special presentation by archeologist Stephen Ellis. And that will be followed by award-winning sommelier and wine educator, Diego Meravia, who will introduce us to some of the wines and grape varietals of Southern Italy's Campania region where Pompeii is located that can be traced back to Roman times. Our first speaker, Stephen Ellis, is a Roman archeologist and professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Cincinnati. His research and publications spring directly from his interests in ancient cities and urban life. He has conducted significant fieldwork projects throughout Italy and Greece and directs the University of Cincinnati's excavations at both Pompeii and now Sardinia at the site of Tharos. He's published on a wide diversity of topics, including Roman retail spaces, urban waste management in antiquity, Greek and Roman superstitions, Roman coins, urban and sacred infrastructure, and the use of new technologies and archeological fieldwork. Among his many publications, he's the author of the Roman Retail Revolution published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And this is a fascinating investigation into the social and economic worlds of the Roman shop, focusing particularly on food and drink outlets. You can tell that's why we've got him here today. His presentation will be followed directly without interruption from me by Diego Meravilla. Diego is a founding member and director of education for the North American Sommelier Association, a not-for-profit that teaches sommeliers, wine specialists, and wine tasting courses for both professionals and amateurs. Diego obtained the gold certification with the, sorry, the gold pin certification with the Italian Sommelier Association in 2008 and the World Wide Sommelier Association. He is a certified specialist of wine with the Society of Wine Educators in the United States. As a native of Northern Italy, Diego is passionate about the ancient history and archeology span of his homeland. And he cooperates with various Italian wineries on the recreation of ancient vintages. He's now based here in Los Angeles and appears regularly around the United States and Canada as a consultant, speaker, and educator. So without further ado, I turn the screen over to Stephen Ellis. Stephen, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Ken, for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's, it's, I'd like to say it's great to be here at the Getty, but of course we're doing things a little bit differently um, uh, these days. But in, in any case, I think this is a, a great opportunity to sort of come together in an online forum uh, and to think about and talk a bit about uh, wine in the ancient Roman world. And what I really want to do is to sort of get behind the scenes a little bit uh, to look at what the new excavations are doing um, or contributing towards the study of um, wine in the in the ancient world. Now, as a, as a topic itself, uh, given the preeminence of wine in Roman society, uh, we should probably be a little surprised about how much uh, we can know about it. Uh, healthy is our knowledge of production processes, for example. So we have uh, a, a good number of, of dolia and presses uh, and, and, and Roman villas that are, that are producing wines. We also know quite a bit about the, the sort of the transportation of wines as well. So we can we can see um, uh, and we can read about and we can see through our, our historic evidence and find the archeological evidence for kind of regional and Mediterranean trade in, in wine um, as well. So many other shipwrecks 
um, that we have throughout the Mediterranean, uh, and in, in, you know, in the many millions are the are the amphorae uh, that come from those uh, uh, those underwater excavations as well. And then lastly, uh, so the consumption at, a, at an elite level of, of wine, we know quite well, thanks again to um, the written record and also largely to the art historic record uh, as, as well, that we can actually start to sort of get an idea of, of what kind of role wine is playing in and across um, Roman society. But what I want to do today is something a little bit different. I want to sort of uh, take a, a, a different kind of look at, at wine and wine consumption and look at the look at the role of wine and the consumption of wine um, at the level of the city. So moving away from the elite consumption of wine, moving away from uh, big sort of regional studies of the, the movement and the exportation and importation of wine and talk a bit more about uh, how wine is consumed at an urban level, at a retail level and at the level of the street uh, itself. To, to do that, what I uh, will be drawing upon is uh, our recent excavations at Pompeii and also sort of a broader study that I've been making of, of cities at large. So all these, these little dots that we see on, on, the, on the screen here uh, are essentially uh, are sites that have been sort of studying the retail landscapes of, of Roman cities. When I study the retail landscapes, what I'm really trying to get at is both the, the social uh, making of cities, how, how cities are organized at, at a social level, at a community level, uh, also the structural making of, of them as well. So thinking about how cities are kind of physically built, but sort of um, uh, laying over all of these kinds of studies is an interest that I have in, in retail space and particularly the retailing of, of food and drinks. As Ken mentioned, that's kind of why I'm here uh, to, today. So some of those, um, those studies have been uh, have been drawn from sort of surveys of these uh, of these archaeological sites across this area, and some have come from excavations as well. So, in terms of the excavations, what I want to do now is to sort of zero in onto uh, Pompeii uh, and onto the neighbourhood called the Porta Stabia uh, neighbourhood. This is the neighbourhood uh, in in the south of Pompeii that is. Uh, if I move forward one more. To give you a sense of where we are located in here, we're down in the south of the city, down near the, the theatres, though some of you might be familiar with the city itself and the structure and the shape of the city. If we zoom in, some of these slides are going to move a little bit. We'll make sure that they go as smoothly as possible. Um, we've been working, the University of Cincinnati and the American Academy in Rome have been excavating uh, this neighbourhood. It's, it's a neighbourhood of, of two town blocks of houses and shops and workshops, but especially um, retail outlets. It's riddled with um, shop fronts. We have uh, about 10 separate uh, 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 property uh, plots of, of land in this area and up to about 20 different shop fronts up and down each side of the street. So we've been excavating into these spaces. And what I want, want to do now is to say, uh, you know, we can't really un have the time to sort of look at all of the information we're getting from the site, but just to say that we've been uh, conducting a rather large excavation and collecting lots of information. And so all this information where we've been able to dig down through the layers, so digging down through the, the latest layer of 79 AD, which was, of course, the city was destroyed at that point, and digging down through the floors, through the surfaces, through the earlier buildings to help us understand what was the development of the site um, of, over time? How did it get to the shape that it was in when it was destroyed in, in 79 um, AD? What that ultimately gives us is, is a couple of different pictures. On the one hand, uh, we know that the, the, the shape of the space um, in 79 uh, AD is itself a very um, heavily uh, dominated by retail and hospitality outlets. We can look at it in sort of images that look like this, but we've also been able to do, um, thanks to the work of, of Gareth Blaney, um, we work together on producing what is ostensibly a, a reconstruction of, of the space, of the site. So what we can do is we can take all that data all that information, we can take the standing walls and all that sur survives around it, and we can start to breathe some more life into what these buildings once were and how they may have once looked as well. That image that we get, that image that comes from, from this, uh, 
is a very kind of vibrant, very vivid kind of image of, of the city, but it's also one that's very, very particularly aimed at the last days of Pompeii. Um, but again, because of our excavations, we've had the opportunity to sort of go down below those layers um, and to get underneath the floors, to get into um, the kitchens, to get into the bar counters, to get into the drains, to get into the toilets even, and to try to sort of flesh out a different kind of, of picture. What uh, that allows us to do now is to think about these bar counters and these wine shops um, in a sort of a more of a historical context. So I've included this slide here um, uh, largely because I'm not going to go through all the different revolutions that I'm talking about here. Basically, there's, there's three retail revolutions where we see big changes um, in the retail shape of Roman cities. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an early one in the second century BCE where we start to see our first big spike in numbers. But the one I want to focus on today, one I think is sort of very interesting, is, is the second retail um, revolution of the Roman world. And it happens in the early imperial uh, period. It happens in the early years of the first century AD or first century CE. Um, and that's when we get essentially the invention of the wine shop, the invention of the, of the bar counter, at least. None of this is to say that, that um, prior to this time that there weren't wine shops and there, there weren't people sort of retailing in, in, in food and drink. They certainly were. Um, but what we get at this time is, is an invention of a new kind of space a very specialized kind of space, because what they start to do now is commit themselves to um, uh, the retail sale of, of food and drink. And it's at this stage that they invent basically this masonry bar counter. These bar counters are uh, typically uh, at the front of uh, these properties in Pompeii. Very often they're L-shaped like this, as you can see here. Um, sometimes they're, they're U-shaped, they'll have another arm coming back in. Uh, at one end, most of them will have a, a, a hearth, a cooking hearth here to heat, uh, to heat and cook foods. Um, uh, there will be storage containers built inside. We'll come back to these in, in a moment as well. These are these earthenware vessels that are storing different kinds of foods that we'll look at in a moment. Um, and also uh, a, a kind of a heavy, heavy display element to these new structures as well. Some will be covered in, in broken off pieces of, of uh, off-cut marble. Others will be, will be painted with quite uh, elaborate designs uh, as well. This is a really interesting development that happens in the early first century um, uh, AD. And it's something we wouldn't know if it wasn't for these excavations into these buildings. So we're not just looking at what they they look like in 79 AD, but trying to understand their life, understand their, their sort of their historical trajectory um, over, over time. What had happened before that in this neighborhood is quite interesting for, for us, is that these shops and the, particularly these bars, the, these food and drink outlets, these wine shops, uh, were essentially replacing earlier production spaces. So up until this point in time, we had uh, these shop fronts that were basically workshops. So they're, they're producing things, they're making things. There's, there's fish sauces uh, that we know they're making in some of these vats down in, in here. Um, other kinds of tinkering of, of, of basically sights and sounds of, of manufacturing and, and, merch and, and merchants building things to then sell from their, from their shop fronts. But then what happens at this time when they're inventing this bar counter is they're replacing all of these workshops with shops. It's a big change because what it does is it really changes the streetscape uh, where once you had the, the sights and sounds of tinkering, of, of making of things, uh, now we have the sights and sounds of people consuming. So it's a very, very uh, important change uh, to the Pompeian streetscape. And it's not just happening in Pompeii as well. Um, we can start to see this now by studying these kinds of properties in other kinds of Roman cities where we can get at that mysterious first century. It's actually quite a, a, a rare opportunity to get at a first century uh, AD city is that we can start to see that these changes are happening sort of across the Mediterranean um, at the same time. What it's reflecting is a newfound uh, uh, confidence, um, a newfound kind of commitment to the retail sale of wine. So things are changing at the urban level, uh, at the retail level, when it comes to, to, to selling and to consuming uh, our food and drink, and not least wine, of course. What will eventually happen, this is, a, this is very much a first century AD development. And then what we'll see is that by about the second century um, AD, 
is that this whole it creates a whole new identity uh, and that gets reflected on things like like tombstones these here are, are tombstones where they're now showing their livelihoods um as selling food and drink and and consuming um uh food and drink and these uh, these these tombstones are really quite fantastic they give us a chance to to look at certain details that we wouldn't otherwise get from the bars themselves from the from the wine shops themselves so at this stage it is a an, Exciting development, I think, in in the Roman city, the consumpt the, the the retail sale of of wine is taking on a, a whole new kind of um, front uh, and a whole new kind of level of of specialization. It's, it won't last forever, uh, and it's actually a very interesting thing. It's it's not just happening for the sale of food and drink. It's also happening, just as a quick aside, it's also happening with the sale of, of sex as well. Um, other kinds of um, buildings are changing shape at this time. So the, 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 the invention of this bar counter, the sort of the rise of these wine shops at this time is tied into a whole bunch of other developments that are happening in the first century. And that's what really Pompeii gives to us, for us, is that we find, again, uh, uh, purpose-built brothels with, with masonry benches used here for, 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 for the beds. Um, this is something that also hasn't appeared before this time. They're certainly selling sex before it. They're certainly selling food and drink in, in, in shop fronts before this period. Um, but right now, they're changing the shape of it. They're changing the physical shape. Um, and they're demonstrating a newfound commitment and, and confidence. So this is the kind of information we can get from uh, the excavations by digging down through these layers. We can start to put uh, these wine shops into a different kind of context. We can start to understand them, understand them historically and, and socially and, and economically uh, as well. Another thing we can do with these wine shops that we've been working on uh, with the Cincinnati excavations is uh, looking at the bioarchaeological record of um, the materials that, that are associated with these bar counters, with these with these shop fronts. So this is the material that that is is pulled out of the drains that come from the kitchens that are serving the bars. Um, it's material is coming from the toilets themselves. Uh, what we essentially do is we float that material, and the bioarchaeological remains, the organic remains, will essentially float more or less. Some of it will float, um, and we can collect that material and start to to look at. Uh, uh, sort of the attendant information as well. So one of the things we can't yet do clearly is understand uh, clearly the types of wines that might be serving in any one of these properties. We have to do, we have to use other forms of evidence to be able to do that kind of thing. Um, what we can do though is get a, a better idea of the kinds of foods they're eating alongside um, uh, these these wines and, and get a different kind of sense of how um, what, what what might have been on the menu uh, for for example or or what um, uh, uh, kinds of foods are coming are being uh, imported into Pompeii or or what kinds of foods are a little bit more localized. Um, Jennifer Robinson, one of our uh, experts here, has, has been able to identify that there's different kinds of shellfish that they're getting um, just from the local neighborhood of Pompeii. And then over time, that changes. They start to bring in different kinds of shellfish. Um, all that information comes from, as I say, this little map on a little plan on the bottom left with the little dots and little lines. That's just basically showing you the different kinds of contexts where we can pull out this information on, on the foods that goes that go with the drinks. So uh, the image up at the top here is basically um, uh, one of our toilets. So we're able to dig down um, to get into that uh, material and, and sort through that. It's a gold mine for, for archaeologists, if, you, if you're wondering. Um, what that is helping us to do, though, is to then try to understand not just what they're consuming, uh, but how they might be consuming different kinds of foods or establishing a different kind of menu from one property to the next. And we got we got some sense of that as we looked around these buildings. Uh, for example, uh, this property um, with the, 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 the reddish pinkish color on it uh, had, had a certain um, a fairly standard kind of menu that we're pulling out of the kitchen that, that served the property there. Uh, whereas up the street a little bit more, uh, we found a, a menu that was much more um, uh, intricate, much more uh, 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 varied, and more likely a more expensive kind of menu, a more expensive kind of um, uh, food uh, uh, on, on, on the plate. Also, what we've been able to do uh, from so our excavations, been able to get this information by digging down through the layers and getting into the drains. Here are these drains that are coming out from 
um, uh, from these properties. But the most recent excavations have come from uh, the Pompeian authorities themselves, thanks to the Grande Progetto uh, di Pompeii in the last few years. And this has been one of the most exciting discoveries, not just for someone like me who, who's really interested in these kinds of properties, but for Pompeii at large. It's one of the most um, important discoveries in, in the last, maybe in the last century or, or, or so, uh, is the, the discovery uh, in, a, in a, a, a fresh discovery through the volcanic material. Uh, it had partly been exposed uh, 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 years ago, um, but it must have been lost and, and cleared out now. And what it has, it, what it is, is of course a, a bar counter that gives us a really, um, not just a very vivid look at uh, wine shops and these bar counters that we haven't been able to get from the, the, the other examples. All the rest of the bar counters in Pompeii uh, aren't as well as preserved as this most recently discovered example. This was really pulled out of the ground just in the last um, uh, year or so. And what it gives us is this great opportunity to look at um, uh, uh, the decorations, the decorations on it are much better preserved, but also to get at the foods as as well. So this has been a, an important new discovery. I've been very, very fortunate to be uh, have some involvement um, sort of behind the scenes with this, working with the superintendencies um, on the information, um, trying to sort of bring this material together for, for publication, but it's all very, very new um, and very, very exciting. And it's actually located up here in this area that's only just now been recently um, excavated in, in, in recent months. Um, what we get from this bar counter, though, is something very different than what we've gotten from, from the others. And it's really quite interesting. Uh, not only is it better preserved, but, but the information it has is actually itself really rather unusual. Because uh, what we normally have associated with these shop counters uh, uh, is, is some foods that have been found inside those vessels that are inside uh, um, uh, the counter. But normally, when those foods are been recovered over the years, uh, it's been uh, things like um, cereals and legumes, dried fruits, nuts, um, that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, food has been, has been recovered from, from the counters. What re was recovered from these um, uh, vessels is a very different kind of diet because what came from this were the bones of animals. Now bones have, have, have never been recovered from, or at least recorded, from these kinds of uh, properties in the past. So we now have bones of, of, of duck, of, of pig, of sheep and goat, um, and, and fish, and a whole bunch of shellfish uh, as well. So it's giving us a really new kind of, not just a better um, set of data um, uh, for 79 AD, but a new set of data as well. It's showing us a, a richer um, a variety of foods that can be sold from these kinds of, of properties. Otherwise, what we have to, to flesh out the, the, the story is, is also um, uh, examples from graffiti and, and wall paintings as well could help us to sort of understand the picture uh, a little bit better. So this graffito on the right here, um, it, it essentially says, uh, it, it, it's speaking uh, for Hedonene, the barmaid. She says, listen, you can drink here for one ass. So the, the, the unit of currency that they're buying drinks for. So you can get a, a, a cup of wine for one ass, but if, but if you give two, you will drink better. And if you pay four of them, you will drink for Lernian. I'm not going to give too much of a way about what these different kinds of wines are, because we have the, the incomparable Diego Meraviglia following um, in, 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 a, in, in a few moments. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to tell us more about that uh, from his expertise. But what we what, what I can say at this point is that we're getting this sign, these these uh, these menus that are that are sometimes we get menus scratched on the walls. Um, sometimes we get graffiti like this talking about the the life of these wine shops, and sometimes we get these um, up on the, uh, the the top left here. We get these uh, uh, vessels of wine. And these these are advertising these different prices. Asses of um, wines, four, three, four and a half, and two asses for these for the for the other uh, costs of these wines that come from this wine shop um, in Herculaneum, not far away from from Pompeii. What it's all helping us to to see is the sort of the richness, the variety um, uh, of these wine shops, and that they that they um, that what we what we should be imagining is is wine shops that are serving. A very rich clientele. When I say rich, I don't mean uh, economically rich, but uh, uh, rich in terms of the um, the stratification of people who are who are coming to these kinds of stores. And so there's new information now that we're starting to understand that 
these, but these bars, these wine shops weren't just for the lowest classes in society, but there was all sorts of grades of them. There were big, large, quite expensive restaurants and, and, and wine shops, and then other dinky little one room shops that selling the selling the cheap stuff, um, as it were. And so when we start to look at all of these shops, all these wine stores um, all around Pompeii, there are some 160 of them, and that's just to, to count them based on having a, a masonry counter um, and, and sort of a, a cooking facility to sort of help help serve the, the food. When we start to look at them, we see just how um, uh, uh, diffuse they were throughout um, the city of, of Pompeii, at least, and certainly other cities um, uh, besides. So we're seeing that wine, wine shops were sort of integrated into all aspects of Roman urbanism spread about across the whole city, mostly on the main streets, mostly at intersections, um, to be sure, but also integrated into houses, both large and small. So this is giving us a chance to recognize that, that the, 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 the um, uh, retailing of, of wine and of food and drink, it's not just a singular activity, it's an activity that is uh, tied into lots of other activities of consumption, of communication, of, of social uh, engagement as well. So there's lots of information, lots of different directions we can take um, in, in looking at what is the role of, of these food and um, of these food and drink outlets. If we move forward, uh, one of those roles can be political. So I, I segue into, into this image. It's an aerial looking down. Um, on top of our, our Porta Stabia site at Pompeii. Uh, and if we look, if we focus in on this um, uh, wine shop down in the corner here, this is a kind of a great example of how we ourselves in a, in a neighborhood like this, it's a very sub elite neighborhood. When it was first cleared of the volcanic debris um, uh, about well, 150 years or so uh, ago now, uh, not a lot of attention was given to preserving these buildings, um, to preserving the wall paintings that would have been on the walls and preserving all the information that might have come from the graffiti um, associated with these kinds of properties. So we have, we have lots of architecture, we have lots of stratigraphic information underneath, lots of bioarchaeological information, but we don't get a lot of decoration or decorative information that could sort of um, help us to better understand um, this neighborhood. But if we start to look a little bit closer into some examples, we can actually start to see, uh, and this has been some great work done by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Jacqueline dibiazi Sammons, who uh, uh, was able to use an, uh, just an app off a, off, a, off, a, off, a, off a smartphone to be able to pull out some of the decorative information, some of the epigraphic information from these wine shops, or for this one at least here, which we, if we do, if we play around with this app, what it does is it, it, it essentially um, enhances the, the color profile of, of a photograph and enables us to be able to start to see things that aren't easily seen with, with the naked eye um, otherwise. What, what, what these images are pulling out um, are electoral slogans, are electoral posters. These are urging you to elect um, uh, Gaius uh, Panza, uh, or Cuspius Panza, sorry, for, for Edal, it's like a, a high, high elected um, official in Pompeii, and it's stamped onto the front of this, of this wine shop. So it's just another example of just how this, there's this interconnection between um, wine and, and, and politics and, and society and, and consumption, it's all sort of binding it, it together. What we can also find is that um, these properties, they're all integrated into their neighboring properties as well. One of the things we tried to do when we started to excavate a whole neighborhood, and you sort of saw it when I was pointing to the, um, the pictures of the two restaurants that are serving different, slightly different kind of menus between one and the next, is we, we, we tried to, to get a really um, detailed look at how one property would, would differentiate itself from its neighboring property. And that started okay as a, as sort of a, as, a, as, a as an approach to, to study this kind of material until we started to understand better that actually these kinds of properties, they are necessarily integrated with each other. They are, they are sharing resources, they're sharing buildings. Um, these, these wine shops are built into houses, but they're not just sort of stuck on the front of a house and, and, and the two spaces kept, kept far apart from each other. And, and, Certainly, they, they could be that as well, but there's an infrastructure into the into the running of these shops of these wine shops that requires those larger houses behind. They're using those houses for storage, so we can see um, amphorae those still stuck into the ash against the wall of an upper 
upper floor of a house above a bar. Um, uh, and that's how the that's how this wine amphorae have been sort of found um, in, in the in the earliest excavations. But we can also see how cooking facilities this here um, is a uh, is, is, is essentially a hearth and the food they're cooking here, they're then serving in the house, this is the atrium courtyard of a, of a rather large house is then being served in the wine shop um, out the front uh, onto, onto the street. So what we're starting to do is to starting to blur these, these binary divisions between houses and shops, um, uh, wine shops and, and domestic spaces uh, as, as well. What all this has helped us to, to try to do as I start to, to wrap things up is, is to start to recognize just the sort of how, how essentially cosmopolitan um, bar culture, wine culture could be in an urban environment. As I say this, uh, this, this drone video, I'm not sure how clear it's gonna be because we're of course online doing things online, but we should be sort of moving up uh, the street here and start to sort of spread out and, the and start to fly up and see just the scale of the city. And what I like um, uh, about about this video, but this drone video I took a couple of years ago now, is that it, it helps me to remind myself of just how we've gone from thinking about how excavations can tell us about one, one room or one property um, and, and compare it to, to, to its neighbor. Uh, what we've been really trying to do with a big excavation like this is to try to integrate all that data, integrate all that information and try to flesh out a different kind of story, a, a richer kind of story, a fuller, kind of story. Um, and, and what that story really is, uh, for me at least, reminded me of is again, this essentially this sort of cosmopolitan nature of, of wine, um, of, of food and drink outlets, just how essentially interconnected they, they all were, um, uh, and how that can also help us to understand something about the index of Roman urban living conditions. We're able to think about different kinds of wines, different kinds of foods, and, and what we're, we're getting from different um, properties in different parts of the city um, as, as well. So I'm gonna uh, uh, sort of start to wrap things up here. I can't do that without mentioning lastly, um, all those who helped to support uh, this project. So all of those are on the screen that you see right now. And I also like to add, either at the very beginning of a talk like this or at the end, but it has to be in here somewhere that you know, my role as the director of, a, of an archeological project like this is really just as a spokesperson for, for a lot of work being done by a lot of amazing people. So none of this could be done were it not for the, the hard work of, uh, of an amazing team of people uh, based at the University of Cincinnati, but of course we're coming from all over, all over the globe to, to, to think about these wine shops and, and food and drink and the retail sale of these um, uh, commodities in a place like Pompeii. At that point, I would like to now hand this over to Diego Meraviglia, who will uh, continue on from here. And I'll, I'll join us again uh, a bit later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. That was fantastic as always. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you may be. So uh, I will try to make the best of the 15 minutes that we have together to talk about exactly what were the wines that were being enjoyed in Pompeii uh, in those days. For instance, uh, what grapes, what varietals, what types of wines. Now you'll see very quickly that the wines per se are, were obviously very different. You know, the winemaking was different. The way that the wines were being enjoyed was different than modern day uh, winemaking and, 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 the, and the wines that you'll be able to find today. Uh, but many many things have stayed the same and many notions many concepts have stayed the same uh i have the fortune my wife is from that area so i have the fortune of being there every single year interacting a lot with the wineries there and doing a lot of work with the uh, grape growers uh this picture you see right here was taken by myself in uh, in one of the wineries that still makes falernum or falerno uh, to this day and every year that they plant new vineyards or uh, dig or do something tilling of the soils, you know, they come up with all sorts of tools and for uh, archaeological uh, artifacts that they keep in the museum of the winery. So it's really, really exciting. So let's try and dive in and understand exactly what were the wines or how can we get close to understanding what the wines that were being offered in Pompeii uh, in, in those days. Now, we don't have solid proof outside of Falernum. We know Falernum has been mentioned. We find it on writings. We find it on etchings. So we know that Falerno uh, or Falernum uh, was a, a, a very important wine that would have been served in those days in the, in the wine bars in Pompeii. Uh, but we know that Romans were 
very hardcore importers. So at the, especially during the height of the Roman Empire, uh, and even before, we know that they were uh, accustomed to importing wines from all over the area. So we most likely had the presence of some Greek uh, wines. Uh, not much beyond that, though, because let's remember that um, vineyards weren't planted uh, further north uh, than uh, central Italy uh, until the Gallic Wars, uh, which took place in 58 uh, to 50 BC with Julius Caesar, uh, and the vines were then planted. So we don't really have imports as far as wines that go beyond the limits uh, of the Italian peninsula and Greece. Uh, but we do know from Pliny the Elder, especially in his writings, that the most famous and revered wines that would have been enjoyed in such a luxurious uh, location as Pompeii was in those days um, were local so they were wines that were coming from the uh, the area uh, it's also a curious fact that Pliny the Elder perished in the eruption of the Vesuvius so uh, from his writings we learned that the region of Campania that we see right here on the screen uh, the political region of what today is the political region of Campania would have been uh, key and the uh, Romans knew the power of this region from an agricultural perspective it was called Campania Felix, the happy countryside. Why happy? Because of the quality of the crops, uh, mainly due to uh, this mountain that we see right behind me here, that you can see on the screen, Mount Vesuvius, Monte Vesuvio. Uh, the primary um, geological factor driving the quality of the crops, and we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, we had two harvests per year uh, in, in uh, Campania, which was un unheard of in many other parts of uh, of uh, of Italy at uh, back then uh, not for grapes because you know we know the vine is a cyclical plant but for other crops we had two harvests in one year and plentiful production so a lot of grapes a lot of agricultural products so the romans knew that this was where they wanted to plant the vines and they knew that the weather the mediterranean climate uh, was key in ripening the grapes uh, in giving flavor to the grapes uh, and in creating uh, a healthy vine for a healthy grape production for a quality uh, subsequent winemaking but it was the volcanic soils that were really key to the terroir this french word that means the sense of place the environment that gave the character and the quality to the wines of this area we are located in southern italy here in the uh, uh in, in the region of campania one of the most active volcanic uh sites in the world and the volcanoes in this area which you can see on the map green ones being the ones that are extinct uh, but the red ones and the orange ones are the ones that are still active today like mount vesuvius in this case still an active volcano uh, still puffing uh, every single year and uh, still full of sensors just in case something happens and the volcanic soils that were created by these volcanoes the romans knew very well was key to the quality of the grapes rich in minerals giving a lot of flavor a lot of character to those grapes in turn to the wines uh, also excellent drainage you know the vine is a plant that hates stagnant water uh, it hates excessive humidity so this was an awesome soil type uh, to produce a healthy tasty and really high quality uh, grape that would provide wines of complexity of structure of personality so we know that wherever we have volcanic soils the romans would have planted the vines and we have examples throughout all of southern Italy, like the island of Pantelleria, beautiful picture here, vineyards in the island of Pantelleria planted right on volcanic rock. Uh, Romans knew this uh, as they expanded throughout the empire, wherever they found volcanic soils, that was key for them to plant vineyards and make high quality wines. So in the area of Pompeii, we owe the terroir, the soils, uh, to Mount Vesuvius. So the Vesuvio uh, is really the father of the character and the quality of the wines that would have been enjoyed in Pompeii in those days and that you can still find and enjoy today, as I said, obviously, with a very different personality due to the modern-day winemaking and modern-day preferences in wine consumption. Uh, wine consumption that today is not taking place by diluting the wines with seawater, which they would have done, spicing them with all sorts of spices and aromas, and sweetening them with honey. So this is something that the Romans were accustomed to doing and would have been doing in Pompeii in those days that we no longer do today. But we can trace the vineyards back. We can trace uh, what then became Appalachians, which I will talk about briefly in a few slides, and we can definitely trace the origin of the wines that are still being made today. Now, I know it's difficult to read on this slide. This is not there for you. Um, folks to read all the vineyards, but this is a very important concept. The Romans 
were the first people in the world to isolate and define single vineyards, something that's very important today. For instance, a famous Italian wine like Sassicaia is a single vineyard. Uh, the French largely commercialized their wines based on single vineyards, if you know your Burgundies and your Bordeaux. So obviously, uh, this was a key and a very important historical uh, fact, that the Romans were the first ones to identify vineyards that were very special, that they knew would produce grapes of great quality, of great personality. One of them being, in that list, if you have a really good eyesight, uh, Falernum. Right, right here, you can see it in the middle, uh, the Falernum Vineyard, which then ended up becoming a, uh, an official Italian appellation that survives to this day. So today, this is the region of Campania with the official appellations that we have. So in ancient times, uh, wines were sold by their vineyard or by their quality or varietal. Uh, Dr. Ellis talked about you drink normal, you drink good, and you drink falernum. So falernum, if you pay more money, would have been that single vineyard. It would have been that grand cru, so to speak, if we want to say it in French terms, uh, of a wine that would have been the best that you could possibly achieve. So today we still have these appellations, and we still have the appellation of Falernum, and we still have the appellation uh, of uh, Vesuvio, or Vesuvius, so, so these official wine denominations that are controlled by the Italian government, uh, they are regulated by the Italian government, uh, and they are extremely historical. Um, something that I think is very important to note here when we talk about appellations is the reason why in Italy, uh, wine is so based on appellations and not on varietal like it is in the United States. Uh, New World wine like California wine or South American wine, we talk about Cabernet, we talk about Merlot, we talk about Syrah, whereas in Italy we talk about Vesuvio uh, or Lacrima Cristi del Vesuvio, we talk about Falerno del Massico, and the grapes are different names uh, and they're regulated, but the place becomes really important and the Romans set uh, the, uh, the notion of this um, thousands and thousands of years ago uh, during those times. So Falerno specifically, we know for a fact, Falernum uh, would have been made with this varietal right here. So we talk about Falangina, uh, the name coming from phalanx or uh, spear because it was um, normal and traditional for that varietal, uh, a very vigorous uh, vine that produces a lot of grapes and grows fast to uh, tie it on uh, spears that they would plant one after the other in the vineyards and then have the vine grow uh, up that, that, phalang that phalanx or, uh, or spear. So the name Phalangina. It is a, a grape that's wonderful. It is typical of Campania. You can find it today in many, many different appellations and versions. Uh, it produces a generally uh, light, crisp, pleasant, very exotic, fruity wine. So not something like a Chardonnay, uh, but something in between like a Pinot Grigio or a Chardonnay. Uh, something not so light-bodied, but not full-bodied, but very mineral, very distinct in its savory, salty profile. Uh, one of my favorite wines. And if you want to try the best appellations these days, I would suggest to look for Sanio uh, DOC. So Sanio would be that appellation uh, that grows the majority and the highest quality of Falangina. And also White Falernum, so Falerno del Massico, which we, saw, which we shall see soon, uh, is also made with this Falangina uh, grape. So we talk about varietals in this case. The other one would have been sourced from the coast area, the Amalfi Coast. So the coastal part of Campania that was very, very much uh, famous in Roman times and in the times of Pompeii uh, that used to grow and still grows uh, a different varietal called Biancolella, uh, a more marine, uh, somehow more light-bodied and quaffable uh, wine-producing grape uh, that is famous in the Costa d'Amalfi uh, DOC. Again, you can find it today, uh, not as uh, popular and widespread as Falangina uh, because the appellation is far smaller and it's far more difficult to actually grow vines uh, and harvest on the slopes of, uh, of uh, the Amalfi Coast. But as you can see, this is an example of a, of a lovely winery called Marisa Cuomo, which is probably one of the best producers of the Amalfi uh, appellation wines uh, that you can see how beautiful uh, these vineyards are, soaking in all that influence from the ocean, all that marine breeze and all that extra saltiness and kind of seawater flavors that you actually do find uh, in these wines. Probably the most important varietal in ancient Rome and in that specific area most likely actually most certainly would have been the main grape for the wine served uh, in the wine bars of Pompeii is a grape called Piedi Rosso. Uh, locally known in dialect as Pere Palummo uh, because of its red stem 
Um, this grape was mentioned by uh, Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder talked about this grape uh, widely in his Naturalis Historia book, uh, which is almost like the best book that we have uh, as wine geeks today or wine lovers today if we really want to understand uh, what ancient Roman wine was. And Piedirosso is still found in that area and it's grown throughout the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. So the, the Vesuvio uh, mountain, the Vesuvio volcano, uh, is uh, planted with Piedirosso vineyards that still produce lovely uh, red wines today that can be enjoyed and found, imported in the United States. You can find them on the market uh, called Lacrima Christi uh, del Vesuvio. So the Tears of Christ of Mount Vesuvius uh, is the appellation. Uh, a little lighter bodied, uh, far more fruity uh, style of wine compared to the other a great grape of the area that would have been present uh, in the wines of Pompeii. Um, this is an image, by the way, of, of the crater of Vesuvius that I took myself. If you ever have the chance to actually go up there and visit the area, there's a beautiful wine bar actually at the top of the crater. This is actually a photo taken from the wine bar at the top of Vesuvius where you can enjoy the actual local wines. It, it doesn't get more farm to table than that, or should I say volcano to table uh, in, in this case. Uh, but the other varietal I was mentioning before would have been Aglianico. And Aglianico, a, a grape that produces far more tannic wines, uh, fuller bodied, uh, stronger, bolder, uh, with higher alcohol, uh, a grape of Greek origin, Hellenico, that the Romans imported from Greece, replanted in the area of Campania on those volcanic soils uh, and obtained some of the best expression uh, red wines that you could possibly uh, find in the area. Uh, and this is the great varietal for Falerno del Massico. So the Falernum wine, the red version, remember there's also a white version made from Falangina, which I mentioned before, the red version would have been made from the Alianico varietal. And to this day, uh, there are a dozen producers of this appellation. It's a small appellation. It's focused uh, in a little area uh, that we know for fact is exactly where the Romans were making those wines. Um, that is exactly where uh, we find all the artifacts as, as we plant vineyards. Uh, and if you visit the wineries in the area, you'll be able to get as close as possible to what the Romans would have been drinking in that area uh, thousands of years ago. This is a picture of one of the vineyards uh, in the Falerno del Massico uh, appellation. Uh, bold wines, structured, aged for decades, uh, superb complexity, uh, really one of my favorite wines in Italy. Um, it is present and imported in the United States, so you can find it uh, if you go online and do a little bit of search. Um, this would be the Appalachian area, so we can see how down south in the Bay of Naples we have the Vesuvius, and then up top we have the area of the Falerno del Massico, where a lot of the volcanic material from previous eruptions millions of years before would have landed, uh, and we have feet and feet and feet deep uh, of uh, pure volcanic ash, compressed volcanic ash, that really give uh, a, a lot of character, personality, and complexity to the wines uh, made by the grapes grown there, uh, which is why we have the regulation, we have the appellation of the Falerno del Massico, uh, and we know that the Romans revered this place uh, and largely produced wine here that would have been fed into Pompeii uh, in the wine bars that Dr. Ellis was talking about. Uh, but if you want to get the closest possible to the wines that were served in Pompeii, a lovely winery and a producer, an award-winning producer in Campania called Mastro Berardino, together with the uh, region of Campania and the Italian government, uh, restarted a project, an archaeological project, to bring back to life what would have been wine made within the archaeological site of the city of Pompeii. Uh, now, vineyards were present back then all the way up to 79 AD when the eruption took place, vineyards were present, but they were largely private vineyards in the backyards of villas of uh, very uh, important uh, uh, rich people. Uh, they weren't wines for mass production, so they most likely were not wines that would have been served uh, in the wine bars, but they, would have, they were wines that would have been consumed and enjoyed uh, by the owners of the villa. But Mastro Berardino, the winery, they uh, did a study of the soils. They actually managed to find uh, traces of where the staves, the poles, where the vines would have been uh, tied to and would have been grown uh, up against uh, and replant the same poles, the same staves in the exact same locations all over the town of Pompeii. If you do go visit the archaeological site of Pompeii, you can see these vineyards, you can visit them. Uh, they are incredible. 
uh, and it's an amazing project. Uh, replanted to those varietals that I was mentioning before, so replanted to Piedirosso and Aglianico, uh, the two grape varietals, and producing this lovely wine called Villa dei Misteri, uh, the Villa of Mystery, so uh, an, an, an homage to uh, one of the fam most famous villas in the archaeological site of Pompeii, uh, made by the Mastro Berardino winery. So this would have been, this would be today the closest that you could possibly get uh, in drinking what exactly was being made, grown, and produced within uh, the archaeological site of Pompeii. But as I said, the other wines mentioned before were most likely, and with the Falerno, with the Falernum, uh, we have certainty uh, the wines served uh, in, in the wine bars that Dr. Ellis uh, has been talking about. So I'd like to thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, nunca est bibendum, so I hope that with all this wine talking and grape talking and vineyard talking, you all have a bottle ready uh, to enjoy for this evening uh, in honor of, uh, of archaeology and in honor of the ancient site of Pompeii. So uh, I thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Diego, for that wonderful tour, which just made me long to, to get back to Campania, not just to taste the wines, which of course we can do here at home with some imports, but also to see the beauty to soak in the sun. I'm also super grateful to Stephen Ellis. Stephen, will you, will you bring yourself back on screen? Here we are. Thank you so much for that fascinating look into the latest archeology span of, of Pompeii and your own work. We have lots of questions. We'll try to get through them um, as many as we can. One of them that came up quite early, very succinct. Stephen, can you recommend, are there any new books about the latest Pompeian archaeology? I know Massimo Sanna, the former director, came out uh -huh. with one in Italian. I don't know that that's been translated to English yet, but maybe it will be soon. But what, what do you recommend to our, yeah, our, I, our audience? I'd say it's a great question. I I would actually try to recommend Massimo Osana's. So it's we can probably get it written up on here. Um, Massimo Osana has a book. Uh, it's in Italian, but there isn't. There's, there's an English um, version promised. Uh, it's the most recent book, and it's the one that really deals with the the new excavations, all this new area that's been um, uh, excavated just in the last, not just years, but the last months um, as well. So that would be worth looking out for. Uh, if other than that, in terms of a sort of a, a fairly recent, um, but very accessible book, maybe maybe you know, Mary, Mary Beard's Pompeii book would be a good place to, to start again. That's, but, a, that, that's a fantastic book, a, a, yeah. a broad overview. A lot, sure. of, a lot of the history and how the history and the questions we have asked has shaped our answers. And a lot of it is sort of unraveling old nuggets and, and challenging mm -hmm. Um, you know, orthodoxy there. Th thank you for that. We have several questions, and I'll just try to, you know, combine them about this idea of the wine being diluted, whether it's with sweeteners or seawater or, you know, other properties. And I think today we kind of sneer at this and think, and one of the, the questions asked, you know, if there were there really good wines if they had to adulterate it this way, or were they adulterating them carefully, adding you know, seawater to balance the salinity of the wines. Can, can either or both of you say more about sort of the enhancements, ancient enhancements to the wines, uh, of which we've gotten a lot of questions? So if I may jump in, I, I think that there's a notion um, that wines in, in, the, in ancient Roman times and times of Pompeii would have been very dense, thick, heavy wines that needed to be diluted. Let's not forget that palate and preference changes. I mean, it's been thousands of years. So, you know, what we're accustomed to today, 14% uh, alcohol wines today is perfectly normal. You know, back then, most likely it would have been something, you know, unheard of. Uh, let's not forget that there wasn't any notion of fermentation. There wasn't any notion of yeasts uh, turning sugars into alcohol. There wasn't any temperature control in winemaking. They, they didn't know that. I mean, the science came way after. So most likely the majority of wines were stuck fermentations. So wines that have only fermented halfway. Uh, and it was really you know, or wines that were fermenting with, with wild yeast that would give off flavors. Uh, so this, this cooking of the wine, this diluting of the wine, was, uh, was not so much the fact that the wine was bad, although if we probably had those wines today, we would definitely think that they were bad because of, 
as a you know the lack of winemaking technology, but out of palate preference. Uh, it's almost like, how do you like your steak? What seasoning do you like on your steak? Do you like salt? Do you like pepper? How much salt? Uh, it's, it's more down to that uh, rather than the wines were bad or the wines were too heavy and they needed to be diluted. That's great. Thank you. Uh, another question and several asked questions about before this development, Stephen, that you talked about, beginning in the uh, first century BC and ramping up of, of this retail revolution of people having wine bars. Uh, one question is, you know, one, do we know where people got their wines and drank? Uh, two, um, you know, what do you think really caused this change in behavior? Was it, you know, the expansion of the Roman Empire, soldiers coming back from campaigns? Are the wine bars on the map they're throughout the city, but they also seem to cluster some of them at, at near city gates, which makes sense if people come in. Could you talk more about the before and the why yeah. to the degree that you're able? So in terms of in terms of before, it's actually really hard to to directly pinpoint where people are buying any any number of things, whether it's wine or whether it's shoes or whether it's jewelry. Um, because prior to that period, um, shops are very generic spaces until that time. So a shop is a shop is a shop, and you can't quite work out what they're selling from each one. So we have only really to assume that they're, they're, they're still buying wine in these kinds of shops and that they're scattered throughout the city. Um, and there's probably some sort of more sort of wholesale areas as well outside of the city where you could get sort of wine in, wine in bulk, um, as it were. But uh it's it's really at that time in the first century when they start to really kind of specialize the space they start to design new buildings to serve food and drink in which they'd never done before so that's a big change so before that it, they're just happy to do it from um shop front shop front spaces probably we, we there's no real clear evidence to that that can help us understand that uh in terms of why all this is happening in the first century it's a it's a big question um i I think what's happening is that this retail revolution is really building on the back of what is basically an urban revolution. And it has to be necessarily entangled together because um, you can't have some kind of rise of retail without having a change of the economy, change of the urban economy. And so it really does point to um, not an isolated event that's happening where there's suddenly you're getting more and more shops and more and more specialized shops but we're starting to see cities changing at that time. What's causing it? Um, this is the great big question, right? It's a much longer answer, but basically at this time, cities are changing because the, the, the Roman world is changing in terms of the economy and trade and long distance trade has been opened up. Um, the seas have been opened up and trade is opening up a lot more. Um, and we see populations are increasing as well. So this is great big, revolution, what people call it cultural revolutions, there are economic revolutions, there's lots of different revolutions happening at this time, and retail is, is one of those. And it would have to be heavily tied to it as well, because when we think of the, the types of buildings in any given city, shops outnumber any other singular type of building in the Roman city. And then of those shops, these new bars outnumber any other singular type of shop as well. So it's a big change happening. Now, most of these bars, they look like they're, they're quite small and they have their, their, their masonry area, which was to serve wine, but also hot foods, cold foods. You mentioned the cereals, the nuts, et cetera. There's a little space alongside. One of our um, viewers and many ask similar questions, but point out today in Italy, if you go into a bar, you pay one price if you stand at the bar and you mm -hmm. pay more if you sit down at a table. How much Perfect. evidence is there for people actually gathering in these small places and consuming their food there rather than taking it away, going somewhere else? We know, you know, there's an inversion. We think of going out to a restaurant is more expensive. Right. But if you were really wealthy in the Roman world, you ate at home because you had your own yeah. cook and, and others would go out. So it's the size and do other finds uh, tell us about the social aspects as opposed to just you needed to eat, you needed to drink, maybe you drank wine because the water was bad, or were you out there socializing, doing a kind of you know, wine bar thing similar to ours, or is it more sustenance? That's again a question, maybe first for Stephen and then Diego. Yeah, so they're, they're doing both, right? They're definitely um, 
taking away and they're definitely eating in as well. And what the archaeological evidence gives, what the architectural evidence gives us is some of these properties are dinky little one room spaces, hardly any room to do much more than just get what you want to get and maybe go eat on the street um, or elsewhere. Others have actually back rooms and they have dining rooms. We can see they're, they're attached to dining rooms with nice wall paintings and dining couches that we would associate with, with quite large houses um, anyway. So, so they're kind of more of a restaurant sort of um, variety of, of, of a food and drink outlet. So definitely both is happening. We know it architecturally and archeologically. We know it um, uh, from literature. Might we read about people going and 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 gathering and and being down you know, cheek by jowl in in taverns and things like this? So we know that people are are staying in these places and 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 hanging out in these places uh, from from the written record and then also and even the, the the graffiti tells us a bit about that as well. They're writing to each other, talking about what they're doing in these places. Um, and then lastly, I would say that the art historic record shows us. This is happening as well. There are some vignettes of, of sort of bar scenes uh, where people, some people are playing games, um, some people are having a, a kiss and a cuddle, some people are in fisticuffs. So there's there's some really great bar scenes that show us that they're that people are sticking around. Great. Diego. Yeah, yeah. To add to that, I, I'm gonna echo Dr. Uh, Ellis's words absolutely. I mean, I think that it is clear that wine. Um, is, is, is for enjoyment, for inebriation purposes in certain time of the day, in certain time of, 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 of the week or the year, but definitely it's also for sustenance, it's for nutrition. Uh, mm -hmm. This concept we can see follows through uh, culture throughout all of Italy. I mean, you, 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 go, you go from ancient Roman times in Italy all the way till modern day, and wine is still uh, you know, a tradition, very much part of the culture at the table uh, for, for nutritional value uh, instead of just enjoyment and inebriation. Um, there was a question I saw which uh, kind of ties into this uh, about the wine that was given to the Roman soldiers. I mean, yes, there was a, we know for a fact there was a, an element of slight inebriation that took away their fears and gave them more courage in battle. Uh, Julius Caesar spoke largely about this in the, in the De Bello Gallico, but uh, not, not so much to get them drunk so that they couldn't go into battle and, 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 and fight. So it was diluted, it was of lower uh, alcohol level, uh, and it was mainly for nutritional value. So we have both. Great, great. Um... One question asked about grain derived uh, brewing. We know that beer goes way back earlier than wine to Mesopotamia and Egypt. Uh, was that prevalent at all in, uh, in Italy or was especially in, in Campania, the wine just so good that beer and, and, and grain brews didn't have, have a chance? Let's remember that for the Romans, what you, what you ate is what you were. Uh, so it was very uh, important from a social status point of view uh, that you consumed specific types of, of beverages and food. Uh, beer did exist, of course, but it was relegated to what were defined as barbarians. Uh, it was consumed more from the northern European populations where the vineyards were not producing good quality grapes or didn't even exist you know, prior to the Gallic Wars, uh, if not you know, very, very uh, few exceptions here and there. So beer did exist. Um, I will let Dr. Ellis say if there's any archaeological evidence in Pompeii that there was beer. I have serious doubts that there that they was consumed. Uh, I think that wine was absolutely the beverage of choice uh, for, for the ancient Romans. Yeah, I don't know of any evidence for it, but I could be missing something that I've never heard of it. Great. There's a question that asks, uh, you know, is most Falangina today aged in oak? And that leads to a broader issue I want to raise, which is barrels for which we have visual evidence for in the ancient world versus amphorae. I throw I love, that open to either love that Diego. Question. You're loving that question. I love that question because that's my. I'm from northern Italy. I'm from. I'm from what was Chisel Pine Gaul before Julius Caesar started expanding uh, and invading north. Uh, barrels were not present and were not used by Romans. Uh, definitely not in Pompeii in those years. Uh, barrels were utilized by the Gauls in northern Italy and over the Alps 
uh, w because of the uh, readily available uh, raw material of wood of the forest. There was more wood available to make the barrels. They were the ones that used those vessels. Uh, Roman wine was all in clay, uh, and it was not uh, in, in, in barrels in oak. So back then, there would have been no oak whatsoever, no wood whatsoever. Let's say wood because the barrels were made by elm, uh, chestnut, cherry wood. It wasn't oak. Oak was a sacred tree back then, so in reality, it wasn't even oak. It was different, different types of wood. Um, today, that philosophy is maintained. Uh, Falangina is almost never, except for a very few initiatives of a couple of wineries, maybe to do something more structured and full-bodied for the international market. But Falangina is generally not aged in oak, and you don't want it to. Uh, you want to preserve the character of the fruit, you want to preserve the character of the soil, you want to preserve the character of the place where the grapes are grown. You don't want to put makeup or masks or layers uh, on top of that purity. Great. Stephen, we have a, a question about the manufacturing shops that were displaced by your retail revolution. Um, mm -hmm. ha have those, those trades didn't, of course, disappear. They were, they were displaced. Yeah. Um, have they been uh, found archaeologically in later levels? Do we see a sort of an urban reorientation with these shops moving in and those manufacturing sites moving specifically somewhere else, or we just don't know where they are and have to assume they're further outside of town or somewhere else? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something in between. It's a question I've been thinking about a lot of, uh, a lot about. Um, what we get is this city of workshops, um, and there's still workshops in the city right through to 79. AD, but but without doubt they're being a lot of them. Um, maybe the majority of them are being replaced by by retail outlets, retail exclusively. Um, some of them, so the fish salting uh, facilities, for example, that we've been able to uncover, uh, we know that Pompeii is still producing fish sauce right through to seventy nine um, AD, but we never found them. We've never found where they're making it, apart from the ones that are sort of underneath these bar counters. So they're probably, they're most likely moving outside of the city. And what's happening at this time is that it's also, we're seeing this time, this sort of the advent of mass production and, and factories on a whole new scale uh, that we haven't seen before. And so for that, they're needing space. And so it's probably happening outside the city and it's outside the city that we've not been able to do wholesale excavations to find right. those kinds of things. Great. Um, there was a couple of questions about the the brand new wine bar with mm. its you know wonderfully preserved frescoes and paintings, but also the, the marble lined one. And a specific question that, that even I can answer, you know, mm. the the marble um, veneers weren't covered with plaster because they themselves were signs of status being imported marble. But could you talk more, Stephen, about the different kinds of decoration of not just the bar, the bar structures, but the bar shops and what those decorations maybe tell us about the clientele, the, the pretensions of the shop owners, uh, how they're trying to position themselves, marble, fresco, what the yeah. frescoes show, et cetera. Yeah, so, so most would have been plastered and, and, and frescoed with, with decorations. And that's what this last one gives us is, is probably well, it is not probably it's certainly the best preserved of the actual images that could be found on top of the on on, on the on the fronts of these counters others that were that were decorated we have um, archival information about what they're showing but most of the decoration has been lost it's been lost to the elements it's been lost to weathering um etc so we, we lose the the detail of it so the late the most recent one is exciting for us because we get a much better a more vivid chance to look at the kinds of things that they were decorating um they counter with that one has you know images of, of animals it has a dog on a on a on a on a on a chain on a lead um it has uh, it has ducks and has fowl um has mythological images others that i've been able to look at and get the information from will incorporate uh theatrical themes so there's there's images of masks uh on them uh the phallus features fairly fairly prominently um as as well on on some others so we're kind of seeing the images on these counters aren't that different to the images that are on the walls behind um and they're actually pretty decently decorated right we're not seeing a, a great difference in I mean, it might be different to some one of the most, you know, uh, uh, beautifully appointed villa, uh, luxury villas in the area. They're not going to replicate scenes like that. 
on the one hand, but they are going to replicate sort of decent houses throughout the city in terms of the kinds of themes and the motifs and the execution of, of that decoration, at least in terms of the plaster. Others also then have um, on the surface, on the top surface especially, sometimes on the front, um, off-cut pieces of marble uh, as well. And they're, they're, they're clearly trying to um, uh, not just reuse, recycle pieces that are, that are available, but, but to you know, create a hardier surface and create a kind of a um, affect a, a, an idea of, of wealth, of money as well, be given that marble would have been associated with, with, with finer architecture. We have several questions about the social interactions within and around the wine bars, if women as well as men were present, and we know from graffiti as well as depictions and frescoes they were. But one question, um, again, always looking for, you know, parallels which are helpful to understand, you know, the, the Spanish tapas bar, but the question, the question of bar hopping, is there any evidence that people went from bar to bar to bar, or do you think people had their favorite you know, corner pub and that's where they went and they were known, or, or do we not really know? Um, I, don't, I don't think we know. I don't think we know. I think we suppose. I definitely like to, to imagine that people had their favorite, their favorite place to go to. You know, one of the one of the things that changed in archaeological methodologies in recent years was a sort of a great interest in spatial archaeology, using machines that go ping to sort of measure out distances from one place to the next, mm -hmm. and then to develop ideas and interpretations of, well, these, these shops or these bars are, are X meters away from these other houses or whatever, so they're going to go to these ones first. I, I never really liked those kinds of readings because, of, from, to my mind, um, it does away with this idea of preferring certain bars, pre pre preferring certain food shops based on anything. Based, it might, might be your cousin's place. It might be um, that the person who works there, right? It might just be better at doing things. It might be better at getting, um, sourcing good foods. Now, sourcing the foods and sourcing all these wines that Diego is talking about is really important um, to, to the success of these, of these properties. And so I like to think that we're not really talking here about exceptions that that people are bypassing some places to go to others, but I think we're talking about a rule uh, of what they would be doing. Now, the evidence for this is hard to get at. Um, it's hard to, for us to know. They're not they're not preserving that information for us. Right. Thank you, Diego. Could you describe and 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 you're trained to put these tastes into words, which is an admirable quality based on experience. A little more about what is distinctive of the volcanic soil, the Vesuvian soil, how it may be a compare and contrast, you know, in terms of what, 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 what are the flavors that are there that aren't elsewhere? What, what sets the volcanic wines apart? So um, structure and complexity, first and foremost, but those are not clear indicators of volcanic soil in the sense that there are other you know, million other factors in other parts of the world that you can have complex and structured wines. It's not that you have to have volcanic soils to have that characteristic. But there are aromatics, uh, ba basically mainly in the mineral family, uh, that really, um, if you're trained and you have had enough of these wines, you really pick out. And I, it's it seems quite kind, kind of silly because it's so obvious, but they smell ashy. They smell vol volcanic. <laughs> <laughs> they, they smell smoky. If you if you actually have the Villa de Misteri wine, which I opened a bottle about two weeks ago, I mean, it smells like being at the top of the Vesuvius. It's got sulfur, which, you know, could come from the sulfites by all means. But there's a typical, typical character of this kind of ashy, um, very rocky, very kind of also iron, notes of iron. Um, if you know, like, for instance, it, it may be a disgusting descriptor, but, you know, blood is something that gets used a lot. There's this kind of like ferrous note, you know, of, of almost blood or red meat. There's this, this character that is typical of volcanic wines. And if you try any of the volcanic wines from southern Italy, uh, not just the Falerno del Massico Red uh, or, you know, the Lacrima Cristi del Vesuvio, but if you even go to Taurasi, which is made with Alianico more inland uh, that came after, or you go to all the other Alianicos, the other volcanoes, Etna, for instance, in Sicily, you, you, you can smell and taste these aromas coming back. That's great. We have time for just one more question. I know there were several, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, which, which has to do with cost. Stephen, you had the wonderful fresco 
basically demonstrating there were wines at different pipe price mm -hmm. points. You could have your 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 your, your very cheap, your mid middle, your high end Falernum. But what does that you know one ass mean? What would that buy you? How uh, how extensive was the cheapest wine versus how expensive was the most expensive wine? I know I go to restaurants today and I'm amazed at you know some of these bottles that are on menus for for four figures and I always wonder what might that taste like. But I I don't think the range was maybe as huge in antiquity. But I guess for the for the historic vintages they were. But but on average, um, what were what was the low, medium, and high? Or yeah, I say you know I have a, a, a crack at that one first. It's the um, it's hard to get a real sense of what that what you know how much money is in people's pockets. There's a big rich conversation about you know basically the the, the monetization of of an urban environment. Um, where we get these prices from, we also get prices for other things as well. And what's kind of interesting is that that one ass is almost a standard price, like a one dollar price for for a lot of things. Um, and so we see also described with the wines, um, sausages, uh, and we'll see that they'll be, they'll cost, you know, one ass for sausages, but they don't tell us how many sausage you get. Uh, they'll say <laughs> cheese, cheese is one ass, but you don't know how much cheese you're getting uh, as well. And so all that's, all that's to say that there is this idea that it's kind of, um, uh, that there's a lot of these things that they're buying here that, um, we can't really know how much they're getting of it, and it's it's curious that they would they would go the extent of putting up a a, a menu a price list um, and have all these different prices, but not really tell you how much you get for that for that money. There must have been a, a grand assumption that you knew what you were going to get because that was what you always what you always got. Uh, in terms of how expensive that would have been, it's it's less than a certainly less than a day's wages. Right, that you're that an average, and it's difficult to do that as well. It's difficult to know how much people, how much money people have, um, but we're talking about small change. Diego, any follow-on comments? I think that's pretty comprehensive. I would have said exactly that. Well, it, it is pretty much time for us to wrap up. I want to thank both of you, Diego and Stephen, and 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 toast you with my. <laughs> Bacchus uncorked glass from days past and hope it's not at all long before we can have another program like this with the live element with the wine tasting but it's great to do it on zoom we had uh over 475 viewers which is fantastic more than we could accommodate at the villa so i'm grateful to the two of you for great presentations uh, i really appreciate the efforts of our team behind the scenes at the getty from our public programs department our events team, our AV department, who have worked so hard to make this possible. That's Lisa, Shelby, Miranda, Danielli, Tony, Gus, Paul, and Ron. It does indeed take a villa. And of course, we're most grateful to you, our, our viewers, for watching, for submitting so many good questions. Uh, please uh, visit our website, Getty EDU What's On, for information about future programs. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, cheers or salve, salvate, as the Romans would say, and, and good evening. Thanks, Ken.